All right, joining us now to talk about all the latest Omicron news is Dr. Paul Offit. Uh, Dr. Offit, Mike Leon, uh, thank you so much for hopping on the Can We Please Talk podcast today. It's my pleasure. Thanks for asking me. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Dr. Offit, before we get into it, I was thinking about this in, in preparing to talk with you, um, and I'm sure a lot of medical professionals are going through something similar, right, where we're seeing a virus and we're seeing vaccines becoming so polarized politically. How, how are you doing, um, just you in general, like how are you doing dealing with people with misinformation or even helping patients, you know, through vaccine hesitancy? How are you dealing as a medical professional with all of this? No, it's really hard. I mean, I can safely say before this pandemic started, there, there was not a year that would go by where we didn't see a child come into our hospital with a vaccine preventable disease that wasn't vaccinated. You know, like for example, influenza um, or pneumococcus or, you know, or chickenpox. I mean, we would see that occasionally, but this is a whole different world. I mean, now, you know, you have had since November the 3rd, um, a vaccine available for children over five years of age. And months before that, you had a vaccine available for children over 12. I mean, the last time I was on service, we admitted 18 children to either into the hospital or into the intensive care unit with COVID. Um, all but one were five years of age or older, and not one of them was vaccinated. I mean, if you look at vaccine rates for the 12 to 15 year old, 50% of children aren't vaccinated. For the five to 11 year old, 70% of children aren't vaccinated. So not only were they not vaccinated, their parents weren't vaccinated, their siblings weren't vaccinated, which is invariably where they got it from. And so you watch these children suffer, you watch them be wheeled up to the intensive care unit, get be sedated so that you can put a tube down into their windpipe and attach them to a ventilator. You watch the parents crying and you think all of this was preventable. And it's just really hard. You know, medicine has limits. There's so many things we don't know. There's so many things we can't do. This we know, this we can do, and people choose not to do it. Yeah, I think that's been the one surprising thing that I've found in life. And, and I, I always see you doing the TV hits, and that's tougher to kind of articulate in a two-minute hit. But here on the podcast, I'm, I'm super appreciative of you saying that. I want to get into the latest Omicron news because, you know, we've seen how this virus has affected the vaccinated versus the unvaccinated. It's been talked about ad nauseum. Um, what would you say to a patient that you have? You just gave that example, but somebody that is still unvaccinated at this point, what is your message to them? Okay. The goal of a vaccine or a vaccine for any of the, for this kind of infection, but meaning a so-called respiratory mucosal infection like influenza is not to protect against all symptomatic illness. It's to protect against moderate to severe symptomatic illness, meaning the kind of illness that causes you to seek medical attention or go to the hospital or go to the ICU or go to the morgue. That's the goal of this vaccine, a goal that has remarkably been met. I don't, I don't think any scientist on this planet would have predicted that two doses of an mRNA-containing vaccine being given close together, meaning three to four weeks apart, would provide this level of long-term immunity against se se severe illness, meaning le level frequencies of memory B cells and memory T cells like T helper cells and cytotoxic T cells, which mediate protection against serious illness, would be this long-lasting. I think everybody assumed you would need a boost four to six uh, months later. And although we do boost, it doesn't in any sense affect protection against serious illness, which is already there, has been long lived, and most importantly, has been true for all the variants. It doesn't matter which of the four variants have come into this country. Still, those vaccines protect against mo moderate to severe illness. It's amazing. It is the greatest medical accomplishment in my lifetime, and my lifetime includes the development of the polio vaccine. That is, you know what, I hope. This falls on the right ears for everybody listening out there as to why you should get vaccinated. I, I wanted to bring in a couple of uh, different articles and, and something that you wrote in the Washington Post a while back. But there was a recent study last week about, you know, Omicron being inherently milder than Delta. And specifically in your area of expertise with kids, children among five years old with a reduction in hospitalizations. Do, do you recall what that study found result wise and why? maybe parents of kids similar to myself that have kids under five that are not available to get vaccinated, why we shouldn't be maybe as worried? Well, so here's what I would say. The, the, there's a study out of uh, Cleveland, Case Western Reserve, another study out of California trying to answer the question, is Omicron infection less virulent than Delta infection? And I think the answer is consistently yes, um, either for admission to the hospital, admission to the ICU, requirement for mechanical ventilation, death, all true. Um, is that also true for children? Yes, it extends down to the five to 11 year old as well. 
Um, and and it's, we're, we're sort of seeing that to some extent, which is to say that more, we're seeing upper respiratory tract infections, meaning croup, bronchiolitis, which involves you know, the windpipe or the first or second branch of the lung, and not seeing so much lower respiratory illness, meaning pneumonia. So I do think o Omicron is, to some extent, less virulent, but, but, but less virulent doesn't mean avirulent. It doesn't mean that you're not going to, in any sense, be uh, likely to be hospitalized or, or, uh, or go to the ICU. And I think this notion of, hey, look, this is the live viral vaccine we were all waiting for. Um, and so let's just lean back, take off our masks, don't worry about it, and get infected with Omicron and have this booster essentially that will protect us for the rest of our lives is a bad idea. You never want to be infected naturally. And in fact, I'd like to know who Mother Nature's public relations team is because she has been trying to kill us ever since we called out of the ocean onto land. You know, virologists don't, for circulating viruses use the term wild type virus. There's a reason for that. You know, I, I can only, you know, pivot it to my area of expertise, which is working in media. So it's almost like one of those things where it's like, I've worked there. You don't know what's going on. I'm telling you that this is what's going to happen. And I, that's why I appreciate uh, you, you not only coming on the program, but the hits that you do on television, really articulating some of this stuff, because to the lay person like me, who does trust doctors and science, <laughs> uh, this is super helpful. But listen, I wanted to ask you because you are on the FDA advisory committee. Um, when do you think the FDA or, or have they started looking at mm -hmm. vaccines for kids younger than age five? What, what would you need to see from the data to at least get you to give an approval from you and your colleagues? In, in terms of when, you know as much as I do. I mean, we, we will be um, we have dates set aside starting from the beginning of February through um, through March and even April. Um, but those dates, when we, we as we get closer, if they don't think they need them, they ask us to eliminate them. So I, I can tell you that when at a recent advisory committee for immunization practices meeting at the CDC, Pfizer stated that they had planned to submit data to the FDA in April. More recently, they stated that they plan to submit to the FDA in March. Um, what I would like to see is what we saw for the five to 11 year old, which is that, that independent of the, which age it was, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, that, it, that if they, they chose a what, single dose and a single dosing interval, that, that you had consistent protection against all those ages because developmentally a five-year-old is not the same as an 11 year old. Secondly, you want to see that they did an efficacy study. I would like to see an efficacy study. There's enough circulating virus that you should be able to see an efficacy study, even for, for studies that have, say, 2,400, 2,500 children, which is what we saw for both the 5 to 11 year old and 12 to 15 year old. I, I would prefer not to just see a so called immunobridging study where they say, look, we have this level of neutralizing antibodies. And if you compare it to studies, they're, they're, that similarly, which, where they did efficacy studies and they had that level of neutralizing antibodies, then we can say that we have the same level of protection. I hope that's not what we're asked to do because I don't think you can extrapolate that. I'd like to see an efficacy study. Um, and I, obviously the most important thing above all is safety, that they have enough children when you feel comfortable that it's safe. And, and the, the reason I do feel good about that is that if you looked at, at myocarditis, which is, was a surprise, I mean, no one expected that you were gonna see heart inflammation as a consequence of the mRNA vaccine. Um, that was primarily a, a disease of the 16 to 17 year old boy. Um, when you went down to 12 to 15 years of age, it occurred much less frequently. That was good. And now as you go down to the five to 11 year old, about 8 million children have been vaccinated. You haven't seen it at all. So I, I feel better than about the. You know, let me, I want to get into a listener question because it's kind of in that realm of the long-term data so far. And I know, you know, the vaccines have only been around for maybe under 18 months. So this is from a listener. Uh, this comes from Crystal in Long Island. And she writes that she has two little girls that are ages five and three. So kind of in that, right on that cusp of getting vaccinated for the older one and the younger one still not available yet. But she has concerns about the vaccine for kids and long-term effects for kids who have not hit puberty yet. Um, obviously, you're in charge of a children's hospital, or at least you work at a children's hospital. What, what would you say about the long-term effects for kids that have not reached the pubescent phase? You know, we've been giving vaccines to children um, since since really the late 1700s. I mean, the smallpox vaccine was given. I got the smallpox vaccine. I'm a child of the 50s. Um, you know, it was given in the first, sometimes in the first few days of life. Often, at least, certainly by the end of the first year of life. Um, so we've been giving vaccines to children for a couple hundred years. The way vaccines work is they induce an immune response, which usually peaks 7, 10, 14 days later, and then that immune response fades. When you see side effects from vaccines, and it's, vaccines can cause serious side effects. I mean, side effects that can cause permanent harm, side effects that can cause death. It's true. I mean, the, the oral polio vaccine. 
was a rare cause of polio. I mean, it occurred in one per 2.4 million dose. It was extremely rare, but it was real. But when those things occur, all those sort of side effects that can occur with vaccines, including serious side effects, I can think of none that have occurred beyond two, two months of getting a dose. So the notion that people have of, well, how do you know five years from now, 10 years from now, 30 years from now? Well, you don't, um, but there has not been an example of that. The only one I can think of actually is, is that the, the oral polio vaccine, when given to an immune compromised host, meaning somebody who was say on cancer chemotherapy or something like that, there the, they could get polio, you know, sometimes months later, not necessarily two. You know, one of the things that's come up in casual conversations with me and, and other, uh, not only listeners, but friends uh, of the show, friends in general, is some of the mixed messaging and confusion around CDC guidelines. One of the things I tell people is, hey, it's guidelines. It's not laws. You know, guidelines means, you know, you follow them. You try to be respectful as best as you can. Um, one of the examples was recently, um, if someone is negative in a household, but everybody else has tested positive, and then after five days of showing negative tests through PCR rapid tests, they come out negative. The person was like, well, can I go out? What do the guidelines say? What would you advise someone who's listening to the program that you know follows these guidelines in terms of what's the safest thing to do when you are unsure? Yeah, it, it's a mess. I certainly agree with that, especially testing. I think testing has just become really confusing for people and including me. Um, I, I would say this, that, that if you have COVID, that you should, should quarantine yourself until you no longer have symptoms. I mean, it, and if within five days, say you no longer have symptoms, then I think you can go out into the world. And if you're indoors um, around other people, you should wear a mask, you know, to have preferably a tight fitting mask. Um, for at least another five days. And I would argue at least for the next, say, four to six weeks until this settles down, and it will settle down, much as it settled down last winter when we didn't have, for the most part, a vaccine and much less population immunity. I, I would just wear a mask indoors at least for the next, say, say, at least till mid or late February anyway, even if you're vaccinated. I think if you're exposed to somebody who, who's infected, um, I think you should probably just assume you may have the, the virus and you don't have to quarantine yourself. Assuming you don't have symptoms, if you're asymptomatic, preferably vaccinated, um, I think you should just wear a mask indoors anyway. But so I think here's how to make it easy. Just if you're sick, stay inside till you're asymptomatic. Dr. Offit, um, the word research has become a buzzword uh, across the landscape. And you hear the, you know, the term or at least the phrase, I'm doing my own research. And it, it makes everyone either laugh, uncomfortable, you start to move in one direction or the other. Somebody that's listening to this program, they actually want to do research in terms of like scholarly articles, opinions, you know, similar to like what we're doing, maybe even listening to a podcast with somebody like yourself featured on it. What's a way that you would advise them besides a consultation as, as your pediatric, but what was a way that you would advise them to actually research and look up data about why they should get vaccinated, why their kids should get vaccinated, et cetera, et cetera? Right. You're not going to like this answer, but here's what I would say to you. If you, if somebody says to me, look, I want to, I want to um, do my research on mRNA vaccines, or I've done my research on mRNA vaccines. Typically what that means is they've read people's opinions about mRNA vaccines on the internet. That's what it really means. If you want to really do your research on mRNA vaccines, you should read the primary data that have been generated with mRNA vaccines. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the original research, as well as the phase one, phase two, phase three data, which is published in terms of how those vaccines were made. You should also understand how mRNA vaccines work. Um, and, and I think to do that, needs, you need some understanding of, of virology, molecular biology, and, and then regarding uh, the, how, how well the vaccine works or whether it's safe, epidemiology. I think few people actually have that expertise. I think few doctors actually have that expertise. I mean, so what do we do? What we do is we, rec we, we rely on advisory bodies that at least collectively have that expertise, at least collectively have read all those articles, like the FDA's Vaccine Advisory Committee or the CDC's so-called Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices. Those groups have gone through all those data and then make recommendations. So, so what I'm, I'm saying that no one will buy into in, in, in the year, uh, what, it, what is this year, 2022 or something like that. Um, I, I think what no one buys into is trust us, we're experts, because you know you wanna believe that you, you can be empowered 
to be your own advocate. And we do that in medicine. We say, you know, here, read this. And, and, you know, and we sort of seed our expertise in many ways. I just, when people say to me, they've done their own research, they've made a decision. I know that they haven't really done the research because it, it's too much to ask to do the research. I, I think it, it's really hard out there because, because medicine uh, or medical innovations in, invariably come with a cost, with a human price. And, and it's, it's hard to accept. I, it's been, certainly been true here. No one would have expected myocarditis as a consequence of mRNA vaccines. No one would have expected blood clots, including serious blood clots, including fatal blood clots associated with these so-called vectored virus vaccines like the, uh, the J&J vaccine or the AstraZeneca vaccine. So you want to try and, and get a hold of that yourself so that you can be empowered to do it. But to really do that requires an extra. Listen, Dr. Offit, the tagline of the show is we talk to people who know what they're talking about. I want to do as a former news producer, I wanted to get back to some expert uh, scholarly opinion and insight. And, and you don't get my opinion because who am I? You get Dr. Paul Offit's opinion. Uh, Dr. Offit, he's the director of vaccine education. He's director of vaccine education center and an attending physician over at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Also, you can go get his book. You bet your life from blood transfusions to mass vaccination, the long and risky history of medical innovation. Dr. Offit, I can't thank you enough uh, for all you do to continue to inform the public, but also for your patients out there in the Philadelphia area. I'm sure they're, they are thrilled that you are their doctor. Thank you so much for appearing on the program today. Continued success and stay safe. Thank you. It was my pleasure.